Chapter 3 Monday, May 27th, 1776 From a newspaper advertisement in the Royal Gazette from New York Run away from the subscriber Living at number 110, Water Street, near the New Slip A Negro girl named Pole, about 13 years of age Very black, marked with the smallpox and had on when she went away a red cloth petticoat and a light blue short gown, homemade. Whoever will take up and secure the said girl so that the owner may get her shall be handsomely rewarded. The snake took us to Miss Mary's house to collect our blankets and two small shoes, but nothing else. We couldn't take Mama's shells, nor Ruth's baby doll made of flannel bits and calico, nor the wooden bowl Papa made for me. Nothing belonged to us. As I folded the blankets, Mr. Robert went out to the privy. There was no point in grabbing Ruth and running. He had a horse and a gun, and we were known to all. I looked around our small room, searching for a tiny piece of home I could hide in my pocket what to take seeds on the hearth stood the jar of flower seeds that mama had collected seeds that she had never had a chance to put into the ground i didn't know what they'd grow into i didn't know if they'd grow at all it was fanciful notion but i uncorked the jar snatched a handful and buried it deep in my pocket just as the privy door creaked open as the wagon drove away, Ruth turned to see the little house disappear. I put, pulled her into my lap and stared straight ahead, afraid that if I looked back, I might break. By midday, we were in Newport, following Mr. Robert up the steps of Sullivan's Tavern. I had never been inside a tavern before. It was a large room, twice as big as Miss Mary's house with two wide fireplaces, one on each of the far walls. The room was crowded with tables and chairs and as many people as church on Easter Sunday, except church was never cloudy with tobacco smoke, nor the smell of roast beef. Most of the customers were men, and a few had their wives with them. Some seemed like regular country folk, but others wore rich clothes not useful for muck shoveling. They made haste tucking into their dinners, playing cards, paging newspapers, and arguing loud about the British soldiers and their navy and taxes and war. Ruth didn't like the noise and covered her ears with her hands. I pulled her toward me and patted her on the back. Ruth was simple-minded and prone to fits, which spooked ignorant folk. Noise could bring them on, as well as a state of nervous excitement. She was in the middle of both. As I patted, her eyes grew wide at the sight of a thick slice of buttered bread perched near at the edge of a table. We hadn't eaten all day, and there had been little food the day before, what with Miss Mary dying. I snatched her hand away as she reached for it. Soon, I whispered. Mr. Robert pointed to a spot in the corner. Stand there, he ordered. A woman burst through the kitchen door carrying a tray heavy with food. She was a big woman, twice the size of my mother, with milky skin and freckles. She looked familiar and caused me to search my memory. We'll have Jenny fatten up the British Navy and make their ships sink to the bottom of the sea, yelled a red-faced man. The big woman, Jenny, laughed as she set a bowl in front of the man. The proprietor called her over to join us. She frowned as she approached, giving Ruth and me a quick once-over while tucking a stray curl under her cap. These are the girls, Mr. Robert explained. It doesn't matter, the proprietor said as he put his hand on Jenny's back. We don't hold with slaves being auctioned on our front steps. Won't stand for it, in fact. I thought this was a business establishment, 
Mr. Roberts said. Are you opposed to earning your percentage? You want to listen to my bill, mister, Jenny said. Advertise in the paper. That's what we do around here. I don't have time for that. These are fine girls. They'll go quickly. Give me half an hour's time on your front steps and we'll bo both walk away with heavier pockets. Jenny's husband pulled out a rag and wiped his hands on it. Auctions of people ain't seemly. Why don't you just talk quiet like to folks? Or leave a notice tacked up. That's proper. I recall an auction not 20 yards from here, Mr. Roberts said. One of Brown's ships brought up a load of rum and slaves from the islands. They must have sold 35, 40 people in two hours' time. Rhode Island don't import slaves. Not for two years now, Jenny said. All the more reason why folks want to buy what I have to sell. I want this done quickly. I have other business to tend to. Is that our problem, Bill? Jenny asked her husband. He says that like it's our problem. Ease off, Jenny, Bill said. The girls look hungry. Why don't you take them to the kitchen? Jenny looked like she had plenty more to say to Mr. Robert, but she gave Ruth and me a quick glance and said, Follow me. Mr. Robert grabbed my shoulder. They've already eaten. No charge, said Jenny evenly. I like feeding children. Oh, Mr. Robert released me. Well, then that's different. Jenny closed the kitchen door behind her and motioned for Ruth and me to sit at the table in the middle of the room. A cauldron of stew hung above the fire in the hearth, and two fresh pies were cooling by the window. Eat first, she said, then talk. She cut us slices of brown bread and ham and poured us both big mugs of cider. Ruth gulped hers down quick and held out her mug for more. Jenny smiled and refilled it. I made short work of the food, keeping one eye on the door in case Mr. Robert walked in. The back door to the kitchen was wide open to let in the breeze. Should I grab Ruth's hand and try to escape? Jenny read my mind. No sense running. She shook her head from side to side. He'll find you right away. I scowled at my bread and took another bite. I'd help you if I could, she said. It'd be the least I could do for Dinah. I wasn't sure I'd heard her right. Pardon me, ma'am? You're Dinah's girl. Knew you when you walked in the door. You knew my mother? Jenny stirred the cauldron of stew. Your mother and your father both. I held you when you were just a day old. I heard she passed away last year. My condolences. She cut two pieces from the apple pie and gave them to Ruth and me. I was indentured when I was your age. Old Mr. Malbone had five of us from Ireland, along with near 30 slaves. Worked us all just as hard, but after seven years, I could walk away, thank the Lord. Dinah was real friendly to me when I first got there, helped me get used to a new place, and people ordering me around. I thought I knew you, I said. She smiled warmly and snatched a piece of apple from the pie plate. You always were the best rememberer I ever saw. We used to make a game of it. Tell you a line to memorize or a song. Didn't matter how much time passed, you'd have the whole thing in your mouth. Made your parents proud. A serving girl came through the door and the talk stopped. Once Jenny had loaded up her tray and sent her back out, she sat down next to me. How did you come to be with that man? She asked. I thought you were at Miss Finch's place. I quickly explained the dizzy events of the last two days. 
There's no telling what happened to the lawyer, Jenny said when I was finished. Boston is a terrible confusion. First the King's army, and now Washington's. What should I do? I asked. The words came out louder than they should have. Jenny gently covered my mouth with her hand. Shh, she warned. You've got to use your head. I grabbed her hand. Could you take us, please? You knew Mama. She slowly pulled her hand from mine, shaking her head. I'm sorry, Isabel. I dare not. But... Bill opened the door and poked his head in. He wants the girls. Best to hurry. A thin woman stood next to Mr. Robert. Her plum-colored gown was crisp and well-sewn. An expensive lace trailed from the small cap on her head. She was perhaps five and forty years, with pale eyebrows and small eyes like apple seeds. A fading yellow bruise circled her right wrist like a bracelet. She looked over us quickly. Sisters? Two for the price of one, Mr. Roberts said. Hardest working girls you'll ever own. What's wrong with them? The woman asked bluntly. Why such a cheap price? Mr. Roberts' snake smile widened. My haste is your good fortune, madam. These girls were the servants of my late aunt, whose passing I mourn deeply. I must quickly conclude the matters of her estate. The recent unrest, you know. A man joined the woman, his eyes suspicious and flinty. He wore a red silk waistcoat under a snuff-colored coat with silver buttons, a starched linen shirt, and black breeches. The buckles on his boots were as big as my fists. And what side do you take in the current situation, sir? He asked. Are you for the king or do you support rebellion? Conversation at nearby tables stopped as people listened in. I pledge myself to our rightful sovereign, the king, sir, Mr. Robert said. Washington and his rabble may have taken Boston, but that's the last thing they'll take. The stranger gave a little bow and introduced himself. Elihu Lockton, at your service, sir. This is my wife, Anne. Mr. Robert bowed politely in return, ignoring the muttering at the table behind him. May I offer you both some sup and drink that we might be better acquainted? They all sat, and Jenny swooped over to take their orders. Ruth and I stood with our backs against the wall as Mr. Robert and the Lockton's ate and drank. I watched them close. The husband was a head taller and twice the girth of most men. His shoulders rounded forward, and his neck seemed to pain him, for he often reached up to rub it. He said he was a merchant with business in Boston, New York, and Charleston, and complained about how much the Boston uprising cost him. His missus sipped Jenny's chowder, shuddered at the taste, and reached for her mug of small beer. She stole glances at us from time to time. I could not figure what kind of mistress she would be. In truth, I was struggling to think straight. The air in the tavern had grown heavy, and the weight of the day pressed upon my head. When the men took out their pipes and lit their tobacco, Ruth sneezed, and the company all turned and considered us. Well then, Lockton said, pushing back from the table to give his belly some room. The wife is looking for a serving wench. Mrs. Lockton crooked a finger at us. Come here, girls. I took Ruth by the hand and stepped within reach. Mrs. Lockton studied our hands and arms, looked at our feet, and made us take off our kerchiefs to look in our hair for nets. Can you cook? She finally asked me. Not much, ma'am, I admitted. Just as well, she said, I don't need another cook. What do you do? I put my arm around Ruth. We can scrub your house clean, care for cows and pigs, work your garden, and carry just about anything. My aunt trained them up herself, Mr. Robert added, and they come with blankets and shoes. Locked inside. Why not wait, Anne? 
to procure another indentured girl in New York. His wife sat back as Jenny arrived with coffee. Indentured servants complain all the time and steal us blind at the first opportunity. I'll never hire another. Jenny set the tray on the table so hard the cups rattled in their saucers. Lockton reached for a plate of apple pie. Are you sure we need two? These are uncertain times, dear. Mrs. regarded Ruth. This one looks simple. Is she adulpated? Ruth gave a shy smile. I spoke before Mr. Robert could open his mouth. She's a good simple ma'am, does what she's told. In truth, she's a harder worker than me. Give her a broom and tell her to sweep and you'll be able to eat off your floor. Jenny poured a cup of coffee and set it in front of the missus, spilling a little on the table. She's prettier than you, Mrs. said, and she knows how to hold her tongue. She turned to her husband. The little one might be an amusement in the parlor. The big one could help Becky with the firewood and housekeeping. Jenny pressed her lips tight together and poured coffee for Lockton and for Mr. Robert. Mrs. bent close to Ruth's face. I do not brook foolishness, she said. Ruth shook her head from side to side. No fooling, she said. The missus cocked her head to one side and stared at me. And you, you are to address me as madam. I expect obedience at all times. Insolence will not be tolerated, not one bit. And you will curb your tendency to talk. Yes, ma'am, madam, I stuttered. What say you, Anne? Lockton said. We sail with the tide. I want these girls, husband, madam said. It is providence that put them in our path. How much do you want for them? Lockton asked. Mr. Robert named his price, our price, two for one, us being sold like bolts of faded cloth or chipped porridge bowls. Wait, Jenny announced loudly. I'll, I'll take them. The table froze. A person like Jenny did not speak to folks like the Lockton's and Mr. Robert, not in that manner. Lockton stared at her as if she had grown a second head. I beg your pardon. Jenny set the kettle on the table, stood straight, and wiped her palms on her skirt. I want them two girls. I need the help. We'll pay cash. Keep to your kitchen, woman. Madame Lockton's words came out sharp and loud. Did she change her mind? Would she really take us? Work in the tavern wouldn't be bad, maybe, and Jenny would be kind to Ruth. I could ask around about lawyer Cornell's papers. When we found Miss Mary's will, I'd work extra to pay Jenny back for the money we cost her, fair and square. Ruth and me would stay together, and we'd stay here close to Mama. Please, God. Please, God. Leave us, Lockton said to Jenny, and send your husband over. Jenny ignored him. It'll take us a couple of days to get your money together, she said to Mr. Robert. We'll give you free lodging in the meantime. Mr. Robert's eyes darted b between the two bidders. Ruth yawned. I crossed my fingers behind my back. Please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please. Madame Lockton flicked crumbs to the floor with her handkerchief. Dear husband, she said. These girls are a bargain at double the price. With your permission, might we increase our offer twofold? Lockton picked at his teeth. As long as we can cl conclude this business quickly. Madam stared at Jenny. Can you top the offer? Jenny wiped her hands on her apron, silent. Well, Madam Lockton demanded. 
Jenny shook her head. I cannot pay more. She bobbed a little curtsy. My husband will tally your account. She hurried for the kitchen door. Mr. Robert chuckled and reached for his pie. Well then, we had a little auction here after all. Such impudence is disturbing, Lockton said. This is why we need the king's soldiers, soldiers to return. He pulled out a small sack and counted out the coins to pay for us. I thank you, sir, for the meal and the transaction. You may deliver the girls to the Hartsborn, if you please. Come now, Anne. Madame Lockton stood, and the men stood with her. Good day to you, sir. Safe voyage, ma'am, Mr. Robert replied. As the Locktons made their way through the crowded room, Mr. Robert, dr Robert dropped the heavy coins into a worn velvet bag. The thudding sound they made as they fell to the bottom reminded me of clods of dirt raining down onto a fresh coffin. Ruth put her arm around my waist and leaned against me.